Welcome on this day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today is Pentecost Sunday. And um, before I get to the reading, I wanted to uh, do something a little bit different and talk a little bit about Pentecost because a lot of people have no idea where the origin of Pentecost actually came from. Now, if you go back and you read the Old Testament, you'll discover that Pentecost was actually one of the Jewish feast days. Only they didn't call it Pentecost. The word Pentecost is actually a Greek word. The Jews called it the Feast of the Harvest or the Feast of Weeks. You'll find it mentioned in five places in the Bible, in the first five books of the Bible. You'll find it in Exodus 23, Exodus 24, Leviticus 16, Numbers uh, 28, and Deuteronomy 16. Now, Pentecost, it was a celebration of the beginning of the early weeks of harvest. You see, in Palestine, there were two harvests each year. The early harvest came during the months of May and June, and the final harvest came in the fall, much like we have our harvest here in the United States. Pentecost was the celebration of the beginning of the early wheat harvest, which meant that Pentecost always fell sometime during the middle of the month of May or sometimes early in June. Now, there were several festivals or celebrations or observances that, that took place before Pentecost. You had the Passover. There was the unleavened bread. And there was the Feast of the First Fruits. Now, the Feast of the First Fruits, <coughs> excuse me, the Feast of the First Fruits was a celebration of the beginning of the barley har harvest. And it's important to know that because that's how you figure out the date of Pentecost. You see, according to the Old Testament, you would go to the day of the celebration of First Fruits. And at the beginning of that day, you would count off 50 days. The 50th day would be the day of Pentecost. So first fruits is the beginning of the barley harvest and Pentecost is a celebration of the beginning of the wheat harvest. And since it was always 50 days after first fruits and since 50 days equals seven weeks, it always came a week of weeks. Therefore, they either call it the first or the feast of the harvest or the feast of weeks. So I you know a little bit about where Pentecost came from. And with that, I'm going to go into a reading, which is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. This is out of the New International Version of Scripture. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that spread and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they're staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews of every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all those who are speaking Galilean? How is it that each of them hears, excuse me, how is it that each of us hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Emilites, Residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors of Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own language. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, 
They've had too much wine. Then Paul, or excuse me, then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what is spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my ser servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. These are the scriptures of God revealing the word of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever had one of those aha experiences when all of a sudden something that you you just didn't quite understand some great truth something that was perplexing you suddenly miraculously makes sense well the disciples who walked with jesus on a daily basis went a very long time before they had this aha experience and this morning, we were gathered here to worship God through singing hymns and prayers and listening to the Word of God. But we've also come to celebrate the miracle of understanding, which is the birth of the Christian church. See, Peter, John, and James and the rest of the disciples had spent quite a bit of time following Jesus around. They were there when he preached the Sermon on the Mount. He told them, over and over again what was going to happen to him and exactly why it had to happen exactly that way. He had to fulfill scripture, the prophecies from the Old Testament. The disciples, they lived with him, they've eaten with him, they followed him, but they still didn't understand him. At the Last Supper, when Jesus predicted his death and comforted his disciples, Peter Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. Again, on the night before Christ's death, he and his disciples went to Gethsemane. And before Jesus went to pray, he said to them, stay and keep watch. Then he returned to find everybody sleeping. He did this three times, and each time he came back to find his disciples asleep. They had no idea what was going to occur. When the crowd came to arrest him, the disciples were completely caught off guard. And after a brief struggle where the servant of the high priest lost an ear, it's written that everyone deserted him and fled. After Christ's crucifixion, the disciples hid behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. And in John's Gospel account, it states that on the morning of Christ's resurrection, Mary Magdalene told Peter and John that somebody had stolen Christ's body. They just didn't get it. They just didn't get it. In fact, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus was walking along with two of them, and their faces were, were downcast. And they described Jesus as a mere prophet who had been crucified. After all that had happened, after spending three years living in the presence of God's one and only Son, even the disciples, they didn't get it. But Jesus, Jesus, he promised them that God the Father would send to them the Holy Spirit. And when that Spirit happened, or excuse me, when that happened, the Holy Spirit would teach them all the things that they would need to know and remind them of everything that Jesus said to them. It would finally make sense. Everything would finally make sense. They would receive 
that miracle of understanding. The birth of the Christian church, it came in the midst of throngs of pilgrims from many, many different nations that were on their way to the temple to celebrate the Jewish festival of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, it's written, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from the heavens and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled. People, it was no coincidence that God selected this time to pour out His Holy Spirit. It was God's desire to reverse the decisive effects of race and nation, the divisive effects that it has. You see, Pentecost, Pentecost reverses what happened at the Tower of Babel, where humankind became fragmented and confused by different languages. At Pentecost, the believers did not speak the same language, no, but they were given the ability to speak the gospel in foreign languages so that everybody could understand. And why is this? Because the Christian church is based on inclusion, not exclusion. In the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 13, it says, For everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, people, no matter what language, no matter what your race, no matter what your place in the food chain of, of humanity may be, it is God's desire that everyone be included in the church of Jesus Christ. God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter to God where we have come from. The only thing that matters to God is where we are going. Like the children's little hymn says, you know, that little song, red, yellow, black, and white, we're all precious in his sight. Again, it is written, and when the crowds heard this, they came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Now, you see, what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on the disciples, it was a visible sign of the Holy Spirit of God. A visible sign of something invisible. We are a church that believes in the glorious resurrection of Christ and the amazing and powerful baptism of the Holy Spirit. As Jesus promised, John baptized with water, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And on Pentecost, the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. First the body as a whole, which is the church was filled. And then each believer was filled as well. You see, it was both corporate and personal individual baptism. Each believer had been commanded by Christ to wait for the baptism of the Spirit, and wait they did. A critical point is this, people. The command to be filled with the Spirit is still to this very day God's command for every single believer, both individually and corporately as a church. Be filled with the Spirit, Paul declares in Ephesians. Are we filled with the Spirit? Once we are filled with the Spirit, what happens? Well, for one thing, we have that aha experience when the spiritual things of God all of a sudden start to begin to make sense. And we also enter the kingdom of God, which is the kingly rule of God in our lives right here, right now, while we are still on earth. We gain the miracle of understanding the beginning and, and, and begin the exciting Christian adventure 
as a part of God's holy church. We're also given gifts of the Spirit, which we understand to be given for the common good. How do we know it's for the common good? Listen to what, uh, what is written in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of it, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now listen to this, this is verse 7. Now to each one of the manifestations of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between the spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one as he determines. You see, for as the church of Jesus Christ, we are all a part of the body of Christ. And we all have an important role in which we are to carry out within the body. And it's for the common good of the whole. Quoting John Wesley in a sermon where he preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he said this, and I quote, were all even then prophets? Were all workers of miracles? Had all the gifts of healing? Did all speak in tongues? No, in no wise. Perhaps not one in a thousand. It was therefore for a more excellent purpose than this, that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. It was to give them what none can deny to be essential to all Christians in all ages, the mind which was in Christ, those holy fruits of the Spirit, to fill them with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness, to walk as Christ also walked, in the work of faith, and in the patience of hope, the labor of love. <laughs> and people, when the Holy Spirit came upon the believers at Pentecost, they immediately began to have that mind of Christ that John Wesley was talking about. They began to walk as Christ walked. And they were given the miracle of understanding. Peter Peter, the man who denied Christ, not once, not twice, but three times, for fear that he would suffer the same fate as Christ, he stood up in front of the crowd and he raised his voice and he preached the first sermon ever in the new church age. And this was a doozy of a sermon. Peter, now spirit-filled, spoke at the top of his voice with authority and forcefulness. What a difference the Spirit made in this man's life. He preached about the prophecy of David, the eyewitness testimonies of the disciples, the exaltation and ascension of Jesus into heaven. He talked to them about heaven. He also talked to them about hell and the reality of hell. And he proclaimed to them that God had raised Jesus from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep hold of him. Then Peter declared, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this this most 
powerful, spirit-filled message is as true and applicable today as it was 2,000 years ago. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are his body, his representatives here on earth. Are we filled with the Holy Ghost? People, I'm telling you, there are no bench sitters in Christ's church. We are all called, all of us are called to be spirit-filled, professing Christians. Using our gifts to help and to save the world. Are we doing this? Are we facilitating the spirit of the church? Or are we too busy trying to block the spirit of the church? I got to tell you, it's easy for us to get caught up in the business of the church. It's easy for us to get caught up in our own issues. And Satan, he loves this more than anything when that happens. Because when the local church, hear me on this, when the local church is allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to take control, lives are changed. Communities are resituated, and there is no more powerful force in the entire world. Before Christ ascended into heaven, he promised the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This happened on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people joined the church of Jesus Christ that very day. There are a lot of wonderful folks who have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. History is filled with them. The history of the church is filled with them. It is the reason that we are able to, to be here collectively in a church building this morning. I know some of you are watching this from home, but it also enables you to do that. You see, people, we are called to be a church which is filled with fire, filled with enthusiasm, filled with love, filled with the miracle of understanding. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen.